We are in our series on the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, we've come to this wonderful passage that encourages us extremely in the fact that we have a Heavenly Father that loves us and cares for us and desires to pour out good things on us. And so I, I want to just say at the onset here, at the onset, of the onset, of the onslaught. But anyway, I want to say this, that we cannot allow the false teaching of the prosperity gospel to cause us to deny the truth that the Bible teaches about God's love for his people and the good gifts that he desires to pour out on his people. And I think that's sometimes what we do. We react sometimes to false teaching and we go overboard and throw the baby out with the bathwater. We can't do that, folks. The Bible is very plain that God desires to pour out lavishly good gifts, good things on his people. Um, just some examples, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17 says, He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. That's pretty amazing. The God of the universe sings over his people. He, he, he rejoices over them with gladness. He quiets us with his love. He keeps us strong in, in, in times that we can't go forward. Uh, Psalm 149, verse 4, says, For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. This is important for us to hear this stuff. The Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with salvation. The godly exalt in glory. Let them sing for joy. Why are they singing for joy? Because God exalts over them, because God adorns them with salvation, because God takes pleasure in his people. James 1.17 reminds us that every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. Every good gift is from above. And so what does this cause us to do? It causes us to rejoice as believers. It causes us to realize, wow, we, we are loved more than we deserve and more than we could ever fathom by a sovereign God who delights and sings over his people. John Piper says concerning this, he says, and listen, listen to this, when, when you pause to consider that God is infinitely strong and can do all that he pleases, and that he is infinitely righteous so that he only does what is right, and that he is infinitely good so that everything he does is perfectly good, when you pause to consider this, then the lavish invitations of this God to ask him for good things with the promise that he will give them is unimaginably wonderful. Now, I can see by your faces that you are just overcome with this this morning. So excited about this. I'm telling you, man, I, I know I cannot conjure up spiritual joy. We can't do it. We try, as humans, we try to jump around in, in light shows and laser shows and fog machines and always do is cough. That's about what but what we've got to do, folks, is begin to, to rejoice in the scriptures and in the promises of a faithful God. And this is what he's telling us. And this sh should be unimaginable to us, that a God who we can't even begin to comprehend has storehouses of gifts and good things that he desires to pour out on his people. God desires. He desires to give good things to his people. So again, you've come to the right church this morning. I want, by now you're probably, wait, is this Greg McDaniel? Is this our pastor who seems to always worry about the fact that we are, are too much prone to, to fall for the prosperity gospel? Yes, it's me because I've been revived by the Word of God, I think. Because the point is, we cannot allow the false teaching to stop us from teaching the true teachings of God's love and desire to bless His people. And so we will look at that scripturally today. We'll look at this text and see what it says about asking and receiving. Because that's what he says, if you ask, you will receive. So let's pray now and ask God to give us hearts to receive his word. Our amazing Heavenly Father, we come to you um, just, just overwhelmed with the truth that you, who are sovereign and in control of the, the universe, desire to pour out good things upon your children, that you dance over us, you sing over us, you rejoice over your people. 
So Father, calls us now to trust in your words, that your spirit envelops us, that your spirit has filled us, and that we have gathered together in your name, and that you are here. So we pray now that you will cause our hearts to be humble before you, that we will receive your word, and that by your spirit's power, we will not only hear, but we will do the things you command us for your glory. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. So let's look first here. What we're going to see is four ways Jesus encourages us to pray. And we've already talked about prayer a few times in the Sermon on the Mount. But as you see, that's a pretty important theme because prayer is the way we communicate with our Heavenly Father. It's, it's the way we show reliance on our Heavenly Father. This is why God commands us to pray. Some would say it's useless to pray because God already knows what you need before you ask, and he's sovereign, so why would you pray? Because he commands us to pray, because when we pray, it shows our total reliance upon him and our trust in him. And so let's notice this. Matthew 7, and we're going to see the first one. The first one is that he invites us to pray. That's very encouraging, the fact that Jesus invites us to pray. Matthew 7, verse 7 and 8 says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Now, this idea of asking and knocking and and seeking, that's all synonyms for prayer. This is how we seek and and knock after the things of God. We ask, and we, we, we do that in prayer. Now, that word ask is the Greek word ateo, and it implies to ask with urgency, to, to ask continually with urgency. And in, in all of these verbs, by the way, the ask, the seek, the knock, they're in the, the present active imperative tense, which means it's not the past tense. We didn't ask and we're waiting now, and we stop asking. We ask once, and that's in the past. It's not in the future. It's not that we're going to ask one day when we feel like we really need God. You know the old adage, well, there's nothing left to do now but pray. Right? It's, not the, it's the present tense, and it's the imperative tense, which means it's a continual now and forever. I am asking urgently for God to supply all my needs. Three times, look at that, three times right here, he not only invites us, ask, seek, knock, and then he reiterates it in verse 8, Whoever, everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, it shall be open. But not only does he really just ask or invite us, he really commands us. These are commands. Ask. He's commanding his people. This is what you do. You rely on me, and you ask, and you seek, and you knock. The the book of Luke has the counterpart to this that we're going to look at in just a moment. It's synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They have very much the same stories, and so we see this same thing mentioned in Luke, and it talks about this importunity, this idea that the the neighbor kept asking, kept knocking, kept banging on the door late at night. This is how God is telling us to pray, that we will totally rely on him and just be belligerent about it practically, that we will not stop asking our father. Why? Because only our father can provide everything we need. So we must be relying on him constantly. Pray without ceasing. So one way he encourages us is by just inviting us to prayer. That's encouraging when when my Savior invites me to pray. But number two, the second encouragement is we see here, is that he makes promises concerning those who pray. He makes promises concerning these prayers. And and notice these as we kind of look through. There's seven of them that we find in this text that we're going to be reading today. Number one, if we ask it will be given. He says, ask and it will be given to you. That's a promise number one. Promise number two, seek and you will find. That's a promise. He's not just saying if you try to talk to God every now and then you may feel that he's heard you. No, these are promises from Christ, our Savior, concerning our prayer. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. That's a promise. Number three, knock and it will be opened. That's a promise. Number four, for everyone who asks, receives the promise. Number five, and the one who seeks, finds. And that is a promise. Six, and to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Not might, 
It will be. This is, these are promises from our Savior concerning prayer. The last one is found in verse 11. How much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Wow. So that, that, that's pretty encouraging, folks. These are encouragements from Christ our Savior on prayer, why we should pray. Number three, the third encouragement we see in this, this text is this, and, and here it is. Everyone who asks receives. And the, the, the emphasis here is on the word everyone. Everyone who asks in verse 8. Everyone who asks will receive. Now, some people have said, well, you know, prayer is for those super Christians. Prayer, you know, prayer is not for everybody. Prayer, prayer only works for some people, but, but not for me. Maybe you felt that way. Folks, this is an encouragement from the Savior. And he makes it very plain that prayer is not some super talent that only a few Christians have. He makes it plain. Everyone, everyone who asks will receive. That's encouraging. Because that's not me telling you to do this. That's not somebody trying to sell some prayer plan. This is our Savior promising us encouraging us that everyone who prays will receive. Martin Luther, the great reformer, who, by the way, we're celebrating the 500th year anniversary of the Reformation, of the day that Martin Luther himself nailed those 95 theses to the Wittenberg church. But look what he says concerning this as he commentated on this very passage. Speaking of God, he says, He knows that we are timid and shy and that we feel unworthy and unfit to present our needs to God. We know that God is so great and we are so tiny that we do not dare to pray. You ever felt that? But look, that is why Christ wants us or wants to lure us away from such timid thoughts to remove our doubts and to have us go ahead confidently and boldly. This is what Christ is doing in this very message, this very Sermon on the Mount. He is encouraging his people Remember, the Sermon on the Mount is not preached for the whole world. It's preached for believers. It's, it, Christ was instructing his kingdom people. And here he's encouraging them and saying, look, you do not have to timidly approach the Father. You can boldly come before him because of my blood. That's what the Bible tells us over and over. So here's the encouragement that Christ gives us here that everyone who seeks and asks and knocks and, and begs and pleads from God their father, they will receive. And I can see, even now, the skeptical looks. Even in, the, even in a church full of Christians, right? You're saying, man, I prayed for things and never received them. And this is it, right? This is where the, the crux comes in. Because we say, but wait a minute. And, and this, is, this is what we got to focus on for a moment. So let's wait a second here. Is this text teaching then, am I trying to tell you that this text is teaching us that prayer is like an Aladdin's lamp that if we rub it, all of our dreams come true and our wish becomes God's command and anything we say, God will do. Is it teaching that? And the answer is, no, it is not teaching that. All right, now there are some that do take these, as we've already mentioned, and would say that it is, that anything you say, anything at all that you pray, God is going to give it to you because that's just the way it is. Any material thing, any desire that you have, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is Jesus is very confidently encouraging us that we can pray, that God hears us, and that God answers us. And that if we ask, we will receive. That's true. Well, Greg, I thought you just said that's not true. I thought you just said that God doesn't just give us anything we ask for. John Stott puts it this way. John Stott, great commentator, says this, It is absurd to suppose that the promise, Ask and it shall be given you, is an absolute pledge with no strings attached. That knock and it will open to you is an open sesame to every closed door without exception. And that by the waving of a, of a prayer wand, any wish will be granted and every dream will come true. And we concur with that. So that's not what we're saying here. So at this point, I want to take a few seconds, okay, a few minutes, 
and dispel a couple of false notions about prayer and some of the false notions that cause these false teachings and misunderstandings and therefore oftentimes great discouragement about prayer and cause many believers just to give up and say, yeah, forget prayer. Number one, one of these false notions that, that comes about is that prayer is somehow unnecessary. It's totally unnecessary. This is the group that would say, plenty of folks get what they need and what they want without prayer. And this is true. It is true. A lot of people, matter of fact, the multitude of people on the planet get what they need without prayer, without praying for it, correct? Think about this. People who deny Christ, people who are atheists, people who are so busy in this life making their kingdoms, they've got what they need. They get food, they get a nice house, nice cars, they get the clothes, they, need. they have children. Yeah, God blesses people, and they never prayed one time for those things. As a matter of fact, we're scratching our head like David saying, well, how do they even prosper? How is this? It happens, right? We've got to be honest. So is prayer unnecessary? Because when everybody out here in the world who can deny God gets what they need without even asking, why then is Jesus talking about asking? It seems that prayer is unnecessary because plenty of folks get what they need without praying. And of course we understand how that works, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, but that's the first misunderstanding or the first false notion that prayer is unnecessary because plenty of people get what they need without prayer. Number two, the second false notion is this, that prayer is unproductive. Because on the flip side, Christians say, I prayed, but nothing happened. I asked, but didn't get what I wanted, when I wanted, how I wanted it. So prayer doesn't work. It's unproductive. I prayed for this specific thing. I prayed for healing for somebody. I prayed for a new job or whatever. I'm just throwing things out. And we know that, that many times we have felt very discouraged because we've had a false notion. And this is where we're going to get here, folks. And therefore, we come to the false conclusion that prayer is unproductive because we didn't seem to see the answers we wanted when we asked. And then we think it's unnecessary because people get what they want without asking. <laughs> so why pray? It's unproductive. That's kind of the, the conclusion there. Now, here's, here's the reason. The reason some think that prayer is unnecessary and that it's unproductive is because they have a faulty understanding of the word gift. We've got to get back to this now because, again, we're praying, and usually when we pray, it's a request to receive something, a gift, a gift of healing, a gift of finances, a gift of, of, of food, of care, of sustenance, whatever we're praying for. Of, of, okay, you got that. In order, here it is, here's the key. We're going to see this key today, and this is very good. Our text is, is just beautiful. Look at this. In order to understand this text, we must distinguish between God's creation gifts and his redemption gifts, okay? So there are two kinds of gifts, okay? There is the creation gifts, and there are redemption gifts. Now you're thinking, what are you talking about? Well, look at this. Look at this. It makes total sense when we see it. And it is congruent with all of Scripture. These distinctions. There is creative gifts of God and there are redemptive gifts. And let me kind of explain the two. Creation gifts are gifts the Creator pours out on His created beings and they are unconditional. These are what we see all through Scripture. This is what Matthew chapter 5, verse 45 talks about when it says... He makes his sun to rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So you see there are creative gifts given by the creator to his creation. Now this is another theological truth we have to grab on in order to understand this principle. And that is, not everybody is a child of God. Everybody is a creation of God. Every human being is made in the image of God, and they bear his image. And that's why we respect all all human beings, and all life is precious and sacred because all humans are made in the image of God. And he is their creator. He is our creator. Okay, so that's the first thing. And as his creatures, 
God has a general grace that he pours out unconditionally on this whole planet. Therefore, the atheistic farmer, he reaps a crop, he bears a crop, just like the Christian down the street. The same rain falls on both of those farms. The same sun comes and shines and nourishes those plants and causes them to grow. God gives the increase by his grace to, to the wicked and the righteous. Those are creative gifts from a creator to his creation. So do you, I hope we see that. Not a little bit to see if you're still here, if you get that, right? Okay. Creation gifts are gifts given by the creator to his created beings. And that's a, an unconditional thing. You don't have to pray for that. Obviously, we see that every day, right? You don't have to pray for those things. You don't have to believe in God for those things. This is his general grace upon his creation, okay? But let us notice the second type of gift, and that's the redemption gifts. Redemption gifts are gifts the Father pours out on his children, and therefore they are conditional, okay? This is... As I, this is congruent with all of Scripture. This is taught throughout the Bible. We are born into this world as enemies of God. We are not in his family. Because of sin, we are separated from the holy God who created us. He is our creator, yes. And he pours out the creation gifts upon his creation at his bidding, and according to his will and good pleasure. But then there are redemption gifts, and this is the gifts poured out upon his children as a father. And I want to notice these conditions. This, these are conditional. Number one, first condition, is that you must be born again. This is found in John chapter 1, verse 12. Look what it says. And it's found throughout the scriptures, but look at this. But to all who did receive him. You see, many did not receive the light. Christ, the light, came into the world, but the world received him not because men love darkness rather than light. But those who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become what? Children of God. Obviously, they were not children of God before. They became children of God. How? By trusting and resting in and receiving Christ as their Lord and Savior. And when we do that, when we trust the gospel, we repent of our sins and trust in the perfect work of Jesus Christ, we supernaturally are born into the family of God. That's why Jesus said in John 3, you must be born again. Why? Because that's the only way you'll become a child of God and he become your father. And, and so that's so important to get this concept, all right? Hopefully this helps unlock this, this mystery of, of, of things as far as prayer goes and, and these gifts. But look at this as we continue uh, to, look, to look at this. The second condition the first condition of a father pouring out gifts on children is that we, number one, become his child. That's through faith in Jesus Christ. Got to be born again. Number two, and here it is, you must pray according to God's will. You, you, you can't just throw out stuff to God and think he's going to answer, okay? As a believer, we can't just say, Lord, I'd like a new Porsche or a Maserati or whatever. We can't just throw stuff out. We must pray according to God's will. 1 John 5.14 makes it abundantly clear. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. So we have a confidence as believers coming before our Heavenly Father in prayer. We have a confidence. But what is that confidence? That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. There's the key, folks. Not only must we be a child of God, but we must pray according to our Father's will, then we can be confident that he hears and will give us what we ask. If we ask whatever we ask according to the will of God, he will give it. This is a bold statement, but he is obligated by his own promises found right here out of the words of Christ, ask and you will receive. Again, Jesus has already talked about this back in chapter 6, so he's, he's in the context of praying in the will of God. He said, as he taught us to pray, we say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He's just building upon that. As we pray, thy will be done, and we ask, 
his will to be done, he will give and we will receive those things that we ask for. The problem is James chapter 4, verse 3. This is our problem. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own pleasures. That's what James is talking about. We're praying about our will, not God's will most of the time. We're praying for our things to be fulfilled, not for God's will to be fulfilled. And, and, and so, so how can we expect God to answer that prayer? And again, folks, it is a total change by the Holy Spirit in us to cause us to pray for God's will to be done because, folks, it's not easy. It's not easy to pray God's will be done. It's easy to pray for our stuff and things we want. Some of the things we want are good things, but they're our will, not God's will. I mean, when we pray for a friend to be healed, that's a good thing, but that may not be God's will. We cannot presume to know all of God's will all the time, but we can look upon the things that he's revealed plainly and pray earnestly after those things. Yet, now, does that mean we don't pray for our friends to be healed? I did not say that. I did not say that. Did I say that we should not pray for friends to be healed? No, I did not say that. The Bible does not say that. As a matter of fact, it says the opposite. If someone's sick among you, call for the elders and pray for them. But even in doing that, we're praying your will be done. We don't know what God's will is there, but we're praying in God's will. You see the difference of praying in God's will and praying in our will, even on good things? We give up this idea that we're now in charge, that we're somehow telling God what to do, and we are submitted to him and saying, Lord, you know best. So it's very hard for a parent to pray, Lord, if it's your will to take my child out of this kingdom and into your heavenly realm, then do it for your glory. It's, it's hard to pray like Paul, Lord, be glorified in my life or in my death. Whatever, Lord, your will be done. That's how Christians pray in the will of God. We pray, Lord, everything I have is yours. Now, that's not easy. You know, again, we got to be careful about prayer. Really, it is a scary thing because knowing that we are approaching the sovereign God of the universe and we are asking him for things, it's very humbling. It should be humbling for us. When we say, Lord, break my heart for you, do you know what we're asking? Lord, make me totally dedicated to you and nothing else. Take everything else out of my view in this world. Do you know what we're asking? I don't think any of us really know. Because the things that it would take sometimes to break our stubborn, selfish wills, I think we would see them as nightmares. And we do not want those. And yet to pray according to God's will is really dangerous work for the believer. I mean, it's really dangerous for our flesh <laughs> and for our comfort and our pleasures. But this is, and I hope now we start to begin to maybe get a glimpse as to why all of our prayers aren't always answered. And what it really means to ask and you'll receive. When you're asking according to God's will, you will, will receive. Do you, see, do you think that when we pray that God calls the believer to be discipled, that they grow in Christ, he's going to answer that prayer. When we pray for lost people to hear the gospel, he will answer that prayer. It may be hard how he does that, it may be, yeah, it's, it's pretty easy, isn't it, right? Lord, send missionaries all around the world and reach people for your gospel. Lord, reach all the people groups in the world. Lord, that's his will. And then he says, okay, your daughter's going. Wait a minute, I didn't actually say that. I was just praying that you'd reach all the people groups, Lord. So what I'm saying is we've got to be totally surrendered to God's will when we're saying, Lord, do these things for your kingdom that you're, that you're wanting to do. You see, again, it's about praying kingdom prayers, not our prayers. And again, those prayers seem kind of boring to the fleshly Christian. I use that term kind of loosely, but to those Christians who are serving their flesh more than concerned about the things of the kingdom. Because if we are in this flesh and in this world, our prayers are saturated with ourselves, no matter how good our intentions are. And we, and we so say, so how do you do this? How do, you, how do we pray in, in the Spirit. we got to ask. we got to ask for that. we got to say, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. I'm going to talk about that in just a moment here. So, so, so what we see literally is what, what Christ is saying is that there's conditions. Number one, you've got to be a child of God before you can expect him to answer you. And number two, 
You have to pray according to his will, that his will be done. Therefore, as Matthew 6, we've got to be seeking first the kingdom of God as we pray. So if we pray according to God's will, he promises to give us good things, it says. All right, now that we've put all this together and we're seeing what Christ says, he says, whatever you ask, whatever you seek, whatever you knock, it will be given. Because do you not know that your heavenly Father, if you being evil can give good gifts. Let's read that as a matter of fact. Look at this. First of all, we, we saw that, um, and I'll read it again for you. You don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll read it for you. But the idea there is that if, if one of you, if his son, we'll look here about um, the fourth thing, desiring good gifts. Matthew 7, 9 through 11 says this, or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a serpent. Or if, 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 if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So you see this very important when we get here. Because what he's saying is, we are evil. I mean, that's the first thing he says. Jesus, When Jesus says you, he makes a distinction here. He changes from, from, from this general speaking, and now he says you separated from me. I'm holy, you're not. Yeah, but if you, who are actually evil, can give good gifts. This is a very important verse, theologically. This is answering that question about, well, if we're sinners and depravity, then we can't do anything good. No, total depravity doesn't mean we can't do good things. It means that we are evil in our very core. See, even Jesus says you're evil but even you can do good things to your kids. You can give them good gifts. Even you know that. Even you know how to give good gifts. So if you being evil in need of a Savior can give good, good gifts, how much more will your heavenly Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask? So that is powerfully wonderful. Now, what are the good things? He will give good things to those who ask. According to his will. We've already covered that. But look at this. What are the good things? All right, here we go. Going over to Luke chapter 11, verse 13, the parallel passage of this very account. And we get, we get some hermeneutics here. We get an interpretation. Matthew said good things. Luke kind of interprets that for us. And here it is. Verse 13. If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Do you see that? The good gift, the ultimate gift that God gives to His people when they ask is the Holy Spirit. This is, this is powerful. This is also um, sometimes non-Baptistic preaching here, right? When we start talking about the Holy Spirit, and we start talking about praying to receive the Holy Spirit, praying that we will be Spirit-led, we get a little antsy, but yet this is exactly what we see Jesus saying here in verse 13. The good things that God will give us when we pray according to his will that he promises, you ask and you will receive. Guess what that is? It's the Holy Spirit being led by the Spirit. Why is this so important? Because, folks, without the Spirit of God, we can do nothing. This church exists as a fraud, as a sham, if we do not rely totally upon the Holy Spirit. If we do not seek the Spirit of God in us. If we, the Bible says, be filled with the Spirit. That takes an effort on our part to say, Lord, I want to die to my flesh. I want to walk in the Spirit. What is it, why does the Bible say things like that? If you walk in the Spirit, you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We have to, we have to say, Lord... I don't want to walk in my flesh anymore. I want to walk according to your will. How do we do this? Lord, give me the Spirit. Now, I understand there's a lot of theological baggage around this, and I'm not going to unpack any of that today, so relax. We know that at salvation, we receive the Spirit, obviously. We know that when we're born again, we are saturated with the Spirit of God. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit of God unto the day of redemption. But I still believe, along with Martin Lloyd-Jones that there is other times of experiencing the Spirit after that. That there are times that we as believers need to pray and say, Lord, I want to rely on your Spirit. I pray for an unction of your Spirit. I don't know how this all works, but I do know that I have failed at this miserably in my own life. 
And is it not easy to, to rely on church programs, to rely on our ideas, our planning, our scheming, right? And to forget the fact that nothing can be done without the Holy Spirit of God. The preaching of the word hits deaf ears unless the Holy Spirit of God churns up the ground and makes it fertile to receive the word of God. We must rely on the Holy Spirit. And look, it's, look at this. Okay, I'm going to hurry. Here's the good things. Here are the good things that come from the Spirit. So this is exactly what Matthew's saying when he says, ask and you shall receive. What are we asking for if we're asking in the will of God? We're not asking for the creation blessings. Those are coming anyway. We're not asking for new cars and new houses and new jobs and raises and more money. That's not what we're asking for. We're talking about these spiritual things that only the Holy Spirit, because this is, these are the gifts that only a heavenly father can give his spiritual children, the regenerate of God. How does he do it? Through the Spirit. Well, Galatians 5.22. This has been under our noses all of our Christian lives, has it not? Look at this. Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit, or the good things of the Spirit, are love. Joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Folks, these are the greater gifts. These are the things we as God's people should be pleading for, begging for, asking for, seeking, knocking for. And the, and the promise is, you knock for these, you ask for these, you will receive. You will receive. Yes, we trust God for our daily provision. We saw that in the Lord's Prayer. We understand that we know that all things come from Him, and therefore we thank Him and trust Him for even the creation blessings that even the heathen get. But as children of God, saved from this world of darkness into His marvelous light, we should just yearn for in our, in our spirits, bearing witness with the Holy Spirit in us, for these things. Why? Because these things are the most valuable. These things are the things that only our Father can give us. These things are the things that will cause any church to succeed. This is, if we don't have this, we will not be of any spiritual good in the kingdom of God. But when we will break ourselves and say, Lord, this is what we want more than anything, the Spirit of God is unleashed. I'm just saying this is what Christ is telling us. Let me say this. These good things, right? Only a heavenly father can give his children. And we must ask for them because he commands it. So here it is. He's not going to just give them, by the way. Yes, he's gracious to us. But he says, ask. He commands. Ask for these things. Seek these things. You don't think you're very loving? Ask God for more love. You got a bitter spirit? You're critical of everybody like we talked about a few days ago? that censorious spirit that judges everybody, plead with God, knock, seek, say, Lord, give me gentleness, peace, joy, love, gentleness, goodness, kindness, patience with other people. That's, spirit, that's supernatural stuff. These are the more valuable gifts, folks. Goodness gracious, man. I pray, I pray. <laughs> Sometimes I'll, I've done this all my ministry, man. Go over to church, walk through the audience, and say, Lord, fill every seat. Let this place be packed out, man. Let this burst out the seams with people. And then we've got to build a bigger building and a bigger building and a bigger building, blah, blah, blah. Keep doing it. And where's that focus? That's definitely my will, right? I mean, yeah, that's great. Now, is it God's will to save souls? Yes. But do you see how that prayer could be changed a little bit? Say, Lord, save your people. Make disciples. It may not even mean this church grows at all, but we, if we could send missions and if we can uh, invest in ministries around us and, and, and see people and we could disciple people one-on-one, -on -one, they may not ever come to this church. But our goal should be first and foremost to build his kingdom, not ours. So praying according to his will is quite different than what we've made it. And here is the final thing I want to close with very quickly. I want to just say, that is the church, I want to apply this message a little, little more directly today than we normally have, okay? Because these are the things we should be asking for in his will. 
Because these are more valuable than money, fame, possessions. So this past week, Greg Marshall, who is here with us, his daughter was murdered in her home. You may have heard about it on Thursday evening. Do you know what gifts they need from God? They don't need a new swimming pool. They don't need a bigger house. They don't need a bunch of money. They yearn for the peace of God. They need a joy. They need hope. (laughs) Do you not see this is exactly what the Spirit gives us? This is how we should pray. This is what it means to pray in the will of God. And do you know what the wonderful promise here is? You know what the wonderful truth of this is? God promises to give it because that's his will. And we as a church body, we're family, right? And so I want us to take a moment right now as we close this sermon out to directly be the church, obeying God's commands and praying according to his will for a broken family. So bow your heads with me, if you will, as I pray for our brother Greg here for these gifts that God promises to give. Let's pray believing and trusting in the word of God and his spirit. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we come to you as just broken people, yet filled with your spirit, given your Holy Spirit. You live within us. And you tell us that we have access to you. We can ask. So Father, we're asking now with all of our hearts, believing that you can bring peace to the Marshall family. That you can give them patience when they're tempted to be bitter and and anxious. Father, we, we pray for the joy of your spirit to fill them and your love. And we pray for the hope that only you can give. And Father, you've promised that you will give these things. So we ask these things knowing that we will receive. We know these things. Thank you for Greg. Give him these things. We pray according to your will and in the confidence of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.